Okay, so everybody, uh, we were talking about the digestive system, and we stopped uh, here uh, by talking about the stomach. Uh, we, in last class, uh, I talked about the parts of the stomach, wall of the stomach, remember that? Uh, there are four layers from inside to outside, everywhere in your GI tract, mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, and serosa, right? Outermost is serosa. Uh, now, in the wall of the stomach, in muscularis externa, there are three layers, three muscle layers. In all other parts of your GI tract, only two. <coughs> so, those three layers, from outside to inside, outermost longitudinal, smooth muscle fibers, middle one is circular, and innermost smooth muscle layer is oblique. Oblique is an extra layer in the stomach. Okay. Then you have the submucosa, and this is the mucosa. Now, if you look at the mucosa, innermost layer of the stomach, you will see something important in the mucosa. You see, in the mucosa, there are crypts, like folds going towards <coughs> like this. The epithelial lining, this is the epithelium. You know mucosa has three layers in, in it. Epithelium, lamina propria, and muscular is mucosa, right? Three layers of mucosa. Now if you see the epithelia of mucosa, it is going in like this. And this part of the epithelial lining, those are going inwards, is called the gastric gland, very important. So gastric gland is the inner part of the epithelial lining. Those are inside the crypts. So, this is the gastric gland here. And in the gastric gland, you have different types of cells shown by different colors here. So, what are those different types of cells? You have parietal cells, chief cells, endocrine cells, and mucus cells. You will see in next slide, just remember, you see different colors, different cells in gastric gland. Now, above the gastric gland, you have the gastric pit. Gastric pit is this part. So what happens, you see here, these, these cells secrete the chemicals here, and then through the gastric pit, the secretion enters into the lumen inside the stomach. Okay? So gastric gland, these cells of gastric gland secrete the chemicals here, then through the gastric pit, the secretion enters into the stomach. Uh, so, let's see the cells. In gastric gland part, as I have mentioned, you have mucus cells, parietal cells, chief cells, and enteroendocrine cells. And in the innermost part, close to the lumen, these cells are simple columnar cells. So simple columnar cells are the innermost cells. <coughs> now, here, you see more clearly this part, the gastric gland, 
that I showed you, right? And that is the gastric peak part. Okay? So gastric gland and gastric peak. And here you see more closely different types of cells in gastric gland. These cells are parietal cells. Parietal cells secrete hydrochloric acid. So parietal cells of gastric gland secrete hydrochloric acid, HCl. And chief cells, these are chief cells, secrete pepsinogen. And pepsinogen is an inactive chemical. Inactive form. Why we need hydrochloric acid? Because hydrochloric acid converts inactive pepsinogen to active pepsin. Make sense? So that's why you need hydrochloric acid secreted from the parietal cells. So what happens? You see? Pepsinogen comes from chief cells and hydrochloric acid comes from the parietal cells and pepsinogen is inactive. Hydrochloric acid converts the inactive pepsinogen to active pepsin. Okay? And active pepsin itself works on pepsinogen and converts more pepsinogen to active pepsin. So pepsinogen also works on inactive pepsin, sorry, pepsin, active pepsin also works on inactive pepsinogen to convert it to active pepsin. <coughs> now pepsin is important active chemical for protein digestion. Enteroendocrine cells secrete gastrin, a very important hormone that regulates the secretion and movement of GI tract, okay? So gastrin, a hormone, comes from the enteroendocrine cells. <coughs> and mucus cells, you see the mucus cells are these cells, and mucus cells secrete mucus that slippery, sticky secretion, thick, slippery, sticky secretion. And mucus is very important. You know what mucus does? The secretion of mucus, that thick fluid, covers the surface of the, inner surface of the stomach. So the hydrochloric acid cannot contract to the wall of the stomach. So, see here, this is the stomach, okay, inside the stomach, okay. Now, mucus forms a layer to protect the wall of the stomach from hydrochloric acid, okay. You know, acid can destroy the wall, but that mucus, slippery thick secretion that covers the surface, inner surface of the stomach wall. So that is very important protection against acidic content inside the stomach. Now sometimes if that mucosal lining is destroyed, then 
then what will happen? The hydrochloric acid or acidic content will cause lesion in the wall of the stomach and cause either gastritis or gastric ulcer. Okay? So if the mucosal barrier or layer is destroyed or removed, then the acid will come in contact, right? To the wall and will cause inflammation of the wall. And if you don't treat it, it will become ulcer. Chronic inflammation will cause, will lead to what? Ulcer, not the gastric ulcer, okay? <clears throat> now, the term you will hear very often, peptic ulcer. Peptic ulcer is the lesion in the wall of the stomach or Duodenum. That's why peptic ulcer includes gastric ulcer and duodenal ulcer. Together is called peptic ulcer. Not together, either. Okay, belongs to peptic ulcer. Most of the cases, uh, about 80% cases, peptic ulcer occurs in the duodenum, okay? And about 20% cases, it is in the stomach, okay? So that mucosal layer is very important to protect the wall of your GI tract. That's why mucus cell that mucus layer is very important. That's why mucus cells should be there, okay? So those are the cells in the gastric gland. Okay. Gastritis is the early stage. If you see gastritis, the lining uh, is not yet, you know, destroyed, but inflammation is there. So you will see redness in the lining of the stomach or duodenum. Make sense? Redness in the lining. But lining is still intact. But ulcer is the lesion. So the damage occurs in the lining. <clears throat> Sometimes if you don't treat the ulcer, it can cause perforation. It can make a hole that would be dangerous, right? If a hole is formed in the wall of the stomach or duodenum, then food materials can come out, enter into the peritoneal cavity. That can cause serious problem. So, gastritis is the early stage, gastric ulcer or peptic ulcer, late, and if you don't treat the peptic ulcer, then perforation or hole uh, can be formed. Regulation of gastric secretion. Gastric secretion means secretion inside the stomach. Okay, secretion in the stomach. That's why it is called gastric secretion. Now, there are three phases of, three phases of secretion. What is called cephalic phase? What is that? If you see the food, like this is your eye, so see the food or smell the food or even think about food in the brain, okay? What happens? Secretion in the stomach occurs. So you see, food is not yet in the stomach, right? You have seen the food, or smell the food, or even, you know, think the food, secretion occurs, gastric secretion occurs. And that is 
called the cephalic phase. Cephalic means head. Everything is happening in the head, right? When you smell, goes to the head, right? That sends signal to the stomach. When you see, goes to the head. Brain. Secretion occurs, right? When you think, occurs in the brain. So, cephalic. Cephalic means head part of the body. Okay? Number one. Then, after you swallow the food, food <coughs> enters into the stomach. You know that. So, when the food is inside the stomach, secretion occurs. You remember in last class I said when you eat the food, what happens? Stomach gets bigger, right? So, mechanoreceptors by pressure are activated. Remember that? And also food is chemical. So, chemoreceptors are activated, right? So, that will cause the secretion and movement. So, that is the gastric phase when the food is inside the stomach. Gastric phase. Okay, number two. So, cephalic phase before the food arrives in the stomach. Gastric phase when the food is inside the stomach. Make sense? Got it? Okay. Then, intestinal phase. What happens? From the stomach, the food enters into the intestine. You know that. So, see here. After digestion of food in the stomach, food enters into the intestine. Now, when the food enters into the intestine, intestine can do what? Intestine can check the status of food, okay? And send a signal to the stomach. If the intestine thinks that digestion is not enough, more digestion is needed, a signal will go to the stomach and tell the gastric gland to secrete more chemicals because stomach didn't perform, didn't do a good job. So, intestine will send signal to the stomach. So, that is the intestinal phase or gastric secretion, remember. So, secretion is occurring in the stomach. That is a reflex. From here, signal is going to the stomach and telling the stomach that secrete more chemicals because the materials you sent me are not enough, you know, uh, digested enough. <coughs> Parts of the small intestine. Small intestine is the longest part of your GI tract. It is two to four meter long and starts at the pyloric sphincter and ends at the ileocecal valve. Three parts of the small intestine are duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Duodenum is the first part of the small intestine and it is the shortest, it is the shortest part. Among those three, duodenum is the shortest part and it is retroperitoneum. When we talked about peritoneum and peritoneal cavity, you must remember this is the abdominal cavity, okay, and from here, this is the parietal peritoneum goes in like this and then covers the abdominal organs like this. Like this, okay? So all these are intraperitoneal organs because inside the peritoneal cavity. Now, we have some few organs, not many, only few organs. Those are 
outside of the peritoneal cavity. Like this is the peritoneal cavity, this parietal peritoneum, parietal peritoneum, peritoneal cavity. Now we have, for example, kidneys are outside of the peritoneal cavity. Behind, this is the front, this is the back. That's why it is called retroperitoneal. Retro peritoneal. Now, duodenum is also retroperitoneal, outside of the peritoneal cavity. But jejunum and ileum, those two parts are interperitoneal. Okay? Only duodenum, the first part of the small intestine, is outside of the peritoneum. <coughs> so, three parts of the small intestine. Duodenum is the first part and its shape is like a C, C-shaped part of the small intestine. So let's see the duodenum, you see here, this C-shaped part is the duodenum. Okay. Now, this is the pancreas okay. and this is the head of the pancreas. You see this part is called the head of the pancreas. This is body and this is the tail. So the duodenum encloses or covers the head part of the pancreas. So it is actually around the head of the pancreas. If you look inside the duodenum, you will see two small openings. One is bigger than the other. These openings in the duodenum are called papilla. Papilla. The larger one is called the major duodenal papilla, and the smaller one is called the minor duodenal papilla. Makes sense, right? Larger one is the major, and the smaller one is what? Minor. Now, why you have those two openings? You see here. This is called the bile duct. So, from the gallbladder, bile enters into the duodenum this way. This is the pancreatic duct inside the pancreas. Now this part is called the main pancreatic duct, the bigger one, and a branch comes out from the main one that is called the accessory pancreatic duct. So now three ducts you can see here, bile duct, main pancreatic duct, and accessory pancreatic duct. Now, if you see the bile duct and main pancreatic duct, this is bile duct, brings bile from the gallbladder, and this is the main pancreatic duct, brings the pancreatic juice, helping digestion. They come and join together here, just before they enter into the duodenum. So, where these two ducts join. That part is a little bit wider. That makes sense. Two tubes are joining there, so it is a little bit expanded here. And that part is called the hepatopancreatic ampulla. Ampulla, remember, if you see a little bit dilated part of a tube, that usually termed as an ampulla. Okay? So, hepatopancreatic Ampulla. And then the joint duct enters into the duodenum. So bile enters into the duodenum, pancreatic juice also enters into the duodenum through the major duodenal papilla. Accessory pancreatic duct also enters into the duodenum separately, and that is the minor duodenal papilla, that opening, okay? Now, <coughs> so 
why why should enter into the duodenum why is very important the bile has bile salt and acid and other chemicals cholesterol cholesterol okay those are the main components of the bile bile is secreted by the liver the liver secretes bile and that bile goes to the gallbladder okay and then from the gallbladder bile enters into the bile duct bile duct okay and then enters into the duodenum okay so if i ask you who produces the bile who produces and secretes the bile that is the liver produces and secretes bile okay so production in the liver hepatocytes are the liver cells that secrete the bile and then most of the bile goes to the gallbladder and gallbladder does what stores and concentrate concentrate the bile okay so remember yes What, yes. What does that do to that process? Yeah, I will talk about that. So, gallbladder stores the bile, right? Now, if you have gallstone or you know uh, uh, infection in the gallbladder, you need to remove the gallbladder. Okay. In that case, uh, you can do that. Gallbladder removal is not. Uh, really very you know problematic because gall stores the bile and release the bile into the duodenum right when the gallbladder contracts bile goes to the duodenum now what the bile does bile helps in digestion and absorption of what fats bile helps in the digestion and absorption of the fat now you have pancreatic juice where you have protease amylase lipase okay so that lipase is also digesting the fat makes sense now you have less fat digestion because you don't have the gallbladder makes sense you don't have the bile so in that case i can prescribe you to take you know the medicine that has the bile okay so if you take that regularly that will you know do the same task particularly if you eat you know fat rich food you should take that now after gallbladder removal uh, often doctors suggest not to eat too much fat rich food makes sense because you have less ability to digest and absorb the fat because you have you know you don't have a stored bile you don't have the gallbladder makes sense so uh, only problem is uh, digestion and absorption of fat okay so now uh, gallbladder stores and concentrate what happens you see the bile secreted from the liver enters into the right and left hepatic ducts hepatic means liver so this is the right hepatic duct this is the left hepatic duct okay and they come out from the liver lobes right and left lobes and join together to form the common hepatic duct makes sense and the common hepatic duct
joins the cystic duct. Cystic indicates the gallbladder, and most of the bile enters into the gallbladder here. And when that bile stays in the gallbladder, most of the water from the bile is absorbed into the wall of the gallbladder. Make sense? Water is taken out from that bile. So what happens? Bile becomes highly concentrated. Make sense? Because you take the water out while the bile is inside the gallbladder. That's how the bile becomes highly concentrated inside the gallbladder. Is it clear? Now, it stays there. When you eat fat or fat-rich food, then signal goes to the gallbladder. That you know, fat-rich food is in your intestine. Make sense? So that reflex will cause the contraction of the gallbladder. Make sense? So gallbladder will contract. So what will happen? Ejection of bile of the side. The bile will be ejected out and will enter into the duodenum. If no fat in the intestine, then it will not eject the bile because bile is needed for the digestion and absorption of the fat. Okay. Sometimes, you know, bile becomes so thick, highly concentrated, and <clears throat> bile has, as I told you, cholesterol, bile has salt, bile also has calcium. So all these things together form stones. <coughs> okay? Bile stones. And cause stone in the gallbladder. Sometimes <coughs> that can block the passage the duct or in the cystic duct, uh, so the bile will not be able to come out. Okay, so that is gallbladder or gall stones. Uh, anyway, so that's how. Now you see the common hepatic duct and cystic duct. They together join to form the common bile duct, which is also called bile duct, okay? Common bile duct or bile duct. So now I'm repeating again, from right lobe, right hepatic duct, from left lobe, left hepatic duct. Remember, hepatic means liver, right? So hepatic. And they join to form common hepatic duct, then cystic duct, from the gallbladder. They join common hepatic and cystic to form the long common bile duct. And that goes all the way to the outside of the duodenum and joins the main pancreatic duct. Okay, that is the pathway of bile. If I ask you, that is the pathway of bile. Now, what happens, how the bile helps fat digestion. <clears throat> Inside the stomach, you see, these are the fat molecules. Most common fat is triglyceride or TG. Triglyceride or TG, that is the most common type of fat that we eat. So, these are large triglyceride molecules. These large molecules cannot be absorbed. You know that. So what happens? The bile salts get attached to the surface of the triglyceride or large fat molecules, okay, like this. So bile salt, okay, get attached 
to the outer surface of the fat and reduces the surface tension. Reduces what? Surface tension. Okay. So, when the surface tension is reduced, the movement in the GI tract will easily break the large fat molecules. Make sense? If you reduce the surface tension, it can, you know, break easily. Make sense? So, actually, this is how the detergents you use in laundry. You know, the detergents you use uh, to wash your clothes. Same way, the detergents work. The, you know, dark particles attached to your clothes. The detergent molecules get attached to them. Okay, <laughs> reduce the surface tension. So when you move, spin or move, the dark particles get broken into pieces. Come out from the clothes. Make sense? So that is called emulsification. So what happens? These large fat or triglyceride molecules are broken into small pieces, and that is called emulsification. Okay. Now they enter into the cells of the small intestine, and what happens? Inside the wall of the small intestine, the bile acids cover the outer surface of these small fat molecules. Now you see bile acids are covering the small fat molecules. These small pieces covered by the bile acid is called chylo microbes. Chylo microbes. Okay. C H Y L O M I C R O N. Yes, chylomicrons are the small fat molecules covered by the bile acid. Now, you tell me, probably you don't know, why these small pieces of fat should be again covered by the bile acids. The bile acid makes these fat molecules more water soluble. Fat is not water soluble, you know that, right? Fat is not water soluble. But these molecules will enter into the blood and will be transported in the blood. Blood is highly watery, okay? So, the bile acids are fat soluble and bile acids cover the fats and make them water soluble. It's like, you know, uh, you are not allowed to go from one place to another, okay? Now, if you hide inside something, okay, and pass that, nobody can see you, right? So, similarly, the fat molecules are covered and the acids are water-soluble. So, water-soluble, uh, they become water-soluble. So, that is the function of the bile. Now, <clears throat> if you see uh, the inner surface of the small intestine, you will see many pores. These pores are circular, like this. These pores are not like, you know, uh, inside the stomach. Inside the stomach, the pores are called rugae, you remember? They are more like longitudinal, but these are circular pores inside the small intestine. And these are called plica circularis. So plica circularis are the circular pores inside the small intestine, okay? Now, on the plica circularis, 
this is a plica circularis, okay? You have finger-like structures like this. So this is a plica circularis, and these finger-like structures attached to the plica circularis, these are called villi. Intestinal villi. And on the villi, you again have tiny hair-like structures, many, just like this. Many hair-like structures, okay? These are called microvilli. Microvilli. So many plica circularis, circular pores and many villi in each plica circularis and many microvilli in each villi. Okay? So, all these structures together increase the surface area. So, the entire surface area, if you make them straight and measure the area, becomes very big. And that helps in the absorption absorption of nutrients you know nutrients are absorbed inside the intestine <coughs> now you tell me a very simple question if the surface area is like this much you know and I put a lot of nutrients on it in this side you have blood blood is sucking Okay, and in another case, I have big surface area, same amount of nutrients I spread, okay, and blood is sucking. In bigger surface area, it will be faster, right? Absorption will be faster because the food can spread, right? Get more area to get absorbed, and blood gets more area to go there, right? Makes sense? So blood will go to bigger surface area and will quickly absorb the nutrients. Makes sense? So, these, all these structures are increasing the surface area for quick absorption of the nutrients. <coughs> so here, you see, this is inside. So these circular pores are plica circularis. These are finger-like structures, villi. And on the villi, we have hair-like structures called microvilli. Here, these are villi, and those are micro villi. They form brush border. Now, if I see inside a villus, villus is singular. Now, if I just take out one finger like a structure, inside the villus, you have the blood capillary as well as lymphatic capillary. So this is the lymphatic capillary, okay? So blood capillary and lymphatic capillary are present inside each villus, okay? Like this, from the wall, blood capillary and lymphatic capillary, they are going in. And you have food molecules here. food molecules, okay? Some food molecules are big, some are small. What are the food molecules? Amino acids or protein? Let me write down actual name. Protein, carbs, and fats or lipids, okay? Now, remember this is important. Protein and carbohydrate molecules are smaller than the fat molecules, and they are water soluble. So carbohydrates and protein molecules easily enter into the blood capillary, okay? Taken into the blood. But most of the fat molecules enter into the lymphatic capillary. 
not into the blood, okay, into the lymph. So fats are taken into the lymphatic capillaries and proteins and carbohydrate molecules are taken into the blood capillaries. And these lymphatic capillaries inside the villus are called lacteas. 